Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, uh, Psalm 72, the end of book 2, says all the previous psalms are the prayers of David. So we take uh, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 as kind of the uh, entryway into the Psalter. What would the obvious meaning of Psalm 1 be? Just kind of like spell it out. Um, for, like what would be the takeaway, kind of the obvious language takeaway from Psalm 1? Yeah, there are two choices. Uh, choose the righteous way. Uh, it won't go well for you if you choose the wicked way. Well, let's look at Psalm 2. And I think that's exactly right. That's the way every that's the way it's intended to be read. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. Now, therefore, kings of the earth, be wise, warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What's the obvious meaning of Psalm 2? For God or against, and how do you show whether you're for God or against God? Who's the person on earth? Be this anointed king, right? And who would you suppose that would be? You're just reading it, just kind of the obvious. Who would that be? David. Now, David put these psalms together. So, how would Psalm 2 relate to Psalm 1, would you think, in terms of? the blessed man and the anointed king. Which side of the equation would David be on, would you suppose? Of the Psalm 1. Would he be the wicked or would he be the righteous? That's the obvious meaning. That's what everybody... That's uh, coming to the restaurant, and I think that's the way you're meant to go with it. But there's some problems with that. And remember, David put this together, and this is the first psalm that he puts his name to. Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now help me. Why was David 
fleeing from Absalom, his son. What had happened in David's life? Uh, do you know that, um, you, you know the story about David and Bathsheba, right? Okay, and so David kills Uriah, who's Bathsheba's husband, and uh, ends up fathering a child, and God judges him and says, you did this in secret, I'm going to do this in broad daylight. And so Absalom um, has a sister named Tamar. Do you remember that story? And he's got a half-brother named Ammon. And Ammon is just smitten, smitten, absolutely smitten with love with Tamar. Maybe we should say lust with Tamar. And he concocts this plan that he gets her in his bedroom alone, and then he rapes her. Now, who, what, what story is that like? Uh, someone smitten with love with the young lady, and he rapes her. Uh, who, what story is that like? It's exactly like a previous story. Do you remember what it is? What? David and Bathsheba, you can see the lust there. But there's, do you remember the story of Shechem and Dinah? Uh, so Dinah says was kind of walking around nonchalant. All of a sudden, this guy is just smitten and he rapes her. And then it says he spoke kindly to her heart and he wants to marry her, right? Do you remember that story? And what do the brothers do? The brothers end up saying, oh, well, the only thing is y'all need to be circumcised first. And so this guy was so in love with this girl that he agrees to be circumcised. And we've talked before that that recovery process is like months long for an adult man. And the text says while they were in their death. Okay, so they are as bad off as you can imagine. Levi and his brother kill every single one of them. And then, and don't you feel that way? Like, yeah. And then Levi and his brother, well, they take all their wives and sleep with them. I mean, after all, I mean, somebody's got to marry these women. Does that, does that sound like, does that sound right to you in the story? It's like, okay, what he did was wrong, but, like, he wants to marry this girl. And, I mean, even if they don't marry, I mean, he did something really horrible, but, you know, in a messed up way, he's trying to fix it. What about Ammon? What does he do? He sleeps with Tamar, his half-sister, and um, she begs him to marry her after it's over. She says, this is shameful as all get out. This should not have happened. But if you ask David, he'll give me to you and we'll marry. And what you did was wrong, but we can make it right. And what does Tamar, uh, what does Ammon say? He says, get out. And it even says with uh, all the amount of love that he had for her after he sleeps with her, it says he hated her with that same passion. So she's begging to marry, and he says, get out, and finally has her dragged out of his bedroom. Who's the worst character? They're both despicable, but who's the worst character in those stories, Shechem or Ammon? Okay, Ammon is. It's like the Sodom and Gomorrah and the Levites concubine. Which one's the worst? It's the Levite's concubine. Okay. So Dinah, uh, or Tamar, has a brother named Absalom. And what do all the names in the Bible mean? And what should we ask? I'm glad you asked. Absalom means the father of peace. Huh. Father of peace, huh? Weird. What do you think Absalom's going to do to Amnon? 
somebody's going to die. And that's exactly what happens. So he kills him. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, you understand the rage. Maybe something short of killing him would be good. David should have taken care of, but David has his own issues with women, so it's hard. Okay, we got a big time problem. Well, he, long story short, David ends up exiling Absalom, and when he brings him back, he treats him kind of like a second class citizen, rightly so. But eventually, Absalom's fed up with it, and so he decides he's going to take David's kingdom. And uh, so he, David uh, runs for his life. Um, he goes to the top of the Mount of Olives, gets two donkeys and hightails it to Jericho. But he leaves all his family and stuff behind, including his concubines. Now, are concubines a good thing or a bad thing in this story? Pretty bad thing for a king to have mistresses David's got mistresses. Uh, he shouldn't have mistresses, but he had mistresses. Leaves his mistresses behind. And guess what somebody <laughs> counsels Absalom that he should do to cement his whole hold on the kingdom? Oh, we think it'd be a good thing if you took all those concubines up on top of the roof and you slept with all of them so that all Israel could see it. Good thing or bad thing? Do you think in the story? I'm voting bad thing, you know, kind of rooftop porn in the ancient world. Maybe not a good thing to do, but that's what Absalom does. That's when David's fleeing for his life. Is David the righteous man in Psalm? Is he the man who's been meditating on the Torah of God day and night? Is David the man, whatever he does, prospers? My vote is no. David was pretty good until 2 Samuel 11. And once 2 Samuel 11 happens, it's chaos in his life. <laughs> so there's a really weird thing that happens in Psalm 1 and 2. And I know we look at a lot of Hebrew stuff in this class. Kind of sorry about that. Well, not really, but kind of sorry uh, this is the word blessed right do you see that ashray if you've had the Hebrew this is the last verse of two do you see that word ashray do you see that's exactly the same word so that's what in literature is called an inclusio where you start and you end in the same thing, right? So you, it's, some people call it a ring comp composition. Um, some people call it an inclusio. You start with the same line you end with. Do you see that that connects these two psalms? Blesses a man, blesser are those who take refuge in him. Now, there's something in this psalm that Hebrew readers could see that we can't see. And it has to do with this word. This word in the text is not written in Hebrew. It's written in another language. It's written in Aramaic. Now, if we were reading this the way they read this, let me get a marker. 
it would be like we came across this sentence written just like this. Kiss in some lest he be angry. Do you recognize that the word den sohn is German? It, it is. You recognize it was in English, right? So if you were reading a poem that said, kiss den sohn, lest he be angry with you, what is the obvious question that you have? What does it mean, and why are you writing words in another language? So, let me try some answers. It's meaningless. Oh, Daniel, you were quick with that. Why, why do you say uh, that's not the answer? Very rarely is it ever meaningless in the Yeah. Well, maybe the, the writer doesn't know how to spell sun. But we have the word sun here. Benny. My Benny, right? Is Benny the same word as bar? No. <laughs> Okay, so the writer knew how to spell the word sun. Why does he spell it in another language? You know how in here we talked about, um, you see those little dots that go on and off there? Okay, so those dots weren't part of the original text. They were written years and years later, 1,400 years later. And those dots are the vowel points, okay? So you remember when we did that, I love my cat and love my coat thing? You remember when we did that? Okay. You could spell this word not to be sun. You could spell it pure. Kiss the pure one. So if it were Hebrew, that's how you would um, do it. Kiss the pure one. Daniel, why are you? Uh, why do you find that funny? Yeah, it's like a double entendre, or. Yeah. Would you grant that there's some weird stuff going on here? Okay. One more weird thing, and you tell me what we should make of it. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. So there are 150 songs. All of the Psalms make the point, don't ever take refuge in a man, only take refuge in God. Everybody's going to admit that in the Psalms. What's the weird thing about 212? The whole point of the Psalms, don't trust in men, trust in God, take refuge in God, What's the problem with 212? Who is the him in 212? It's the son. 
but I thought you weren't supposed to take refuge in men. And this is telling me to take refuge in the Son. Who is the Son? The Son is the King. One more thing, and you tell me you find this interesting. Kings of the Lord set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Do you see that? Uh, Emma or is anyone else taking the Hebrew in here? Emma, do you know what that word would be? Messiah, right. Against Yahweh and against his Messiah. Oh my goodness, that's a lot different, isn't it? What if we're coming to the Psalms with the obvious plain language understanding that the New Testament is saying is a fundamentally wrong way to interpret the Psalms? What if we're doing with the Psalms exactly what we did with the Sixth Sense and we came with an obvious meaning and God actually had a meta narrative meaning that points beyond the obvious to the true meaning of these texts? That's how the New Testament writers do all the Psalms. that the denouement is saying yes read them as David's voice but the problem is the words don't actually work when you do that do you think I mean if David was trying to present himself as a righteous person and as God's anointed king is he going to put Psalm 3 the very next verse David was meditating on something at night, and it wasn't God's story. It was on this beautiful, naked woman that he was voyeuristically just peer, leering at over his castle wall. David is not the righteous man of the Psalms. There's another righteous man who never stays home from any battle, who never... Uh, lusted after anybody else's wife who's pure and righteous who is the anointed king blessed are those who take refuge in him how we're reading the psalms we're reading them on the narrative le level when the new testament is telling us to read them on the meta narrative level and the difficulty is, imagine that you had the sixth sense. So we were watching that movie again. And all you had was that one scene, right? And somebody watched it with you and you said, oh, Bruce Willis is dead. Uh, she can't see him. Uh, this is a year. He's been dead a year. How convincing of that meaning would you be? It's like, oh, man, you're eisegeting that text. You're bringing, it's just not there. But then when you get to the end and you see what the director did, and you say, what's the meaning of that text? The meaning of that text, the authorial intended meaning of that text is to point to someone who's not there and to a wife who's grieving over her lost husband. So what we're after in studying the Old Testament is not any kind of fanciful exegesis. What we're after is the authorially intended meaning. But the author has told us, go back and look at the details. The details don't work on a purely meta narrative on a pure, purely narrative level. 
the details only work if you look at the meta narrative level in the story of Jesus. So we're going to do a few more uh, psalms. Again, there's no homework. We only have six uh, more times together. I don't know if you know that, but we're going to look at some of the psalms and a few other things. And I hope you have a really good break, and I'll see you a uh, week from now.